Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to see you at this mental health stage, and we will be talking about art and mental health. So during this session, we will be talking about how art impacts our emotional state, how it engraves in our heads things that we live through. And it becomes a mental diary of the world and for the world for many years ahead. So we will talk about how culture and art can help us overcome psychological mental challenges now. We have some fantastic guests on the stage. Bot Amber, the husband of the Prime Minister of Denmark. Michel Greetings, Michel Azanavichus, who is a French director. Sean Penn. Greetings, Sean Penn, Hollywood actor, producer, director, producer. Vlada and Kostya Liberov. They are Ukrainian photographers. So you know that we were supposed to have another important person. Igor Kozlovsky was supposed to be with us. He is a philosopher and historian. He spent 700 days in captivity. But this morning, unfortunately, we got bad news saying that tonight he passed because of heart attacks. So our condolences to his family, to his friends. We will remember him forever. And Igor, your contribution to Ukraine's life, to Ukraine's history, will remain with us forever. Now, Igor's story and the stories of millions of Ukrainians, that's yet another tale about Ukraine's resilience. And no matter what we see and live through, we move on, we progress. And that's exactly what we will be discussing. We'll talk about art which helps us improve our mental health and which helps us overcome challenges. In September, the question is for you. So you have been a director in many TV series and TV shows and films. So when do you plan to start making a film about Ukraine and Ukraine's war and what kind of soldiers you will show? Well, uh, a film about Ukraine I'd like to do and I'd like to start it very soon, but I think my colleague here has uh, come before me and will probably do it better, so I think I'll... I'll back down on that one. Um, should I elaborate a little bit about the subject? Uh, I think, to be honest, I don't really think I can tell you anything about the subject that you probably don't know in advance. And I think you have uh, probably uh, considered it and, and uh, better ideas than I have about this subject. But I can tell you some of my uh, personal experiences. I'm uh, doing fiction films. And uh, my consideration is that the artistic interpretation is able to do something that hardly any other form of communication can do. It can bring us into the room of feelings, emotions, it can um, teach us about relations between people. It can give us, um, what are they, what's it called? It can give us uh, experience of how uh, characters act and interact between them and thereby giving us some learning about how to handle our own problems and issues. And I think that's a very important thing about the, the uh, interpretation of things. Um, I think memory, at least mine and perhaps some other people's too, memory is strongly related to emotions. Hard, almost all I know about previous big wars in history, I know through fiction. The great American uh, film directors interpreted the visions on the big wars that America participated in. 
And I think the learning I got from there told me stories about the horror of war in a way that I can emotionally understand. I mean, I can cope with a lot of factual information, but very soon after I forgot it. That's not the way I think the emotional impact works. And that's why I, I've been doing a lot of documentary stuff and I still love doing it, but leaning more and more into fiction because I think it gives us as artists a freedom to interpret it and maybe, I'm not sure about this, but maybe get a little closer to truth, at least what we think is the truth. So, um, yeah, that's more or less what I'll say right now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Sean Penn. Sean Penn, over to you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the story of Sean Penn is very unique. He came to Ukraine one week before Russia launched its full-scale invasion against Ukraine. You came back then to fill about the Donbass war, which has been going on since 2014. You visited Ukraine even before that, and, uh, of course, you understand understood so much about Ukraine and Ukrainians. And using the opportunity, I must mention that the film about Ukraine is called Superpower. And it, I have now the pleasure to announce that the showing will occur on September 18th. So we all look forward to see that film. And thank you so much for doing all this for Ukraine. So Sean, in your opinion, what is Ukraine's superpower and Ukrainians' superpower? I'd like to say, sort of echo what Mr. Tenberg just, just said. You know, they, there's, a, there's a, a novel by Alejo Carpentier called The Last Steps, where he, it's a discovery of the notion that music, which we had all been taught, was originated in birdsong. And but I recommend the book, and I'll let you learn the arc of where it gets to this and by reading it. But it, where it leads is this idea, this discovery that in fact, music is is fundamentally and primally human, and that can be said of the arts in, in general, and about the way in which interpretation of truth is the greater truth, and 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 recognizing the, the different ways people interpret the same thing, and finding the positives, the connections in that is sort of the aspiration, I, I suppose. What happened here, what I, what, I, what I see in Ukraine, I'm born in 1960 in the United States of America. We are told it's the greatest country in the world we are, we, from the time we're born. And it's a, there's so much great about it. And, you, you know, I, we say of our children, Oh, my kid's the greatest kid in the world, but that's not how we really mean it. They're the greatest kid for us, right? And then they're also magic on their own terms. But within all of that, that we, that I, my generation of American was so hard hardwired, even once we gain a skepticism or simply more information and say, well, measured by what? Measured by you know, and you can go into all of the areas that we have excelled at and the great things that have happened or the areas that we've failed at or been uh, more or less intrusive in other ways. But the thing that's really, I, I speak for myself, but I know because of the conversations I've had with others, the one we don't want to give up on more than anything is this idea of we are one. And we are absolutely not in the United States in a way that is so tangible and so disconnecting and so rageful and diminishing and bitter and petty. And that's us attacking our own imaginations. And so coming to Ukraine, And I just flash ahead for a moment. The great hope is that Ukraine becomes the story changer in human history and maintains this unity 
in peacetime. But to come to this country at this time was really knowing the weight of this when we talk about mental health on our, my children, on our children, the weight of this division, and not knowing you know, how to be a bridge, and many times remembering how one has been part of the divide. And then you come here and you say, oh my God, what's the, what is that smell? What's that air? And it's unity. And you realize truly what you've been missing and truly how significant that is. So I think that that's why this place at this time, even selfishly, you know, I, I, I put my kids ahead of my country, ahead of any country. I, and for my kids, Ukraine has to succeed. So just rounding it out, when we talk about, you know, the, the mental health aspect of all of it, you know, wherever we can find that primal human voice uh, and find it together and, and celebrate the millisecond on earth that we all have together as a globe, as, as you know, as a positive force for the future, the better. And you know, clearly, I wouldn't have spun my wheels in some creative area all my life had I not felt that art has um, not just a healing impact, but it's actually um, a, a kind of a constant presence of our better selves realm of possibility. Надзвичайно приємно взагалі вас слухати. І знаєте, от мені здається, що зараз ментальне здоров'я It's so great to hear that because the mental health of many Ukrainians improved just listening to you. So separate thanks for that. But you are observing us, the Ukrainians, as an outsider, even though you come from time to time to different places, uh, having an, uh, your own personal eyewitness experience of how we are defending against this Russian attack. But have you noticed that the Ukrainians have changed, whether their mental health state changed, whether their mood has changed, like what was a week before the full-fledged invasion or in your previous visits to Ukraine and now? Well, it's funny. The Not a lot. I do know there's, of course, a lot of fatigue. Uh, without fatigue, new bursts of energy don't come. Without fatigue, one isn't human. Within that fatigue, there is, you know, the word resiliency certainly comes up a lot. But we're talking about a resilience that's on a level that I've never known. Uh, and so, while I am an observer in terms of country of origin and the particular challenges uh, and the hardships that are being faced in the pursuit of freedom here, there's a, there's, we humanly have some ancestral DNA attached to these times in human history where greatness rises up. So I think my focus is on the beauty and the greatness of this thing. My hope is that whatever changes with those changes will come resurgence each time. And I think that, you know, we're all depending upon it, and that's why uh, I think we have to, to be on the right side of human history, um, not only create with Ukraine in mind, but also provide what you, whatever Ukraine needs to win this dream for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, pan 
Азанавичус. Thanks a lot, Mr. Azanavichus. Uh, first of all, this is not your first visit to Kiev, to Ukraine, right? And uh, of course, I would grasp this opportunity to thank you for your 125,000 euros to rebuild the Zoom hospital, which was partially destroyed and uh, by the Russian invaders. And your switch shirt reminds reminds us that you are an ambassador of United24 that was founded by uh, the president. So, Mr. Michel, you visit Ukraine on numerous occasions. You visited Bucha, you visited Irpin, uh, you're in Kyiv now. So, what impresses you the most? Well, not necessarily in the exact locations that you visited, but in the people that you see and meet here. Um. What impresses me the most is the strength and, and the courage of all the people I met. But I met some people who are very involved in, in the organization, and so they are in the action. And I guess it's not the same for people, um, average people in, in the country. So I might not have a perfect vision of Ukrainian people. But still, the people I met, the people I talked with, were very impressive. Um, their confidence, confidence in victory, but also uh, something that you can feel that people are really in the truth of the situation. Nobody pretend anything. Nobody plays some uh, anything. Uh, it's you. You have the feeling that people are really in the truth. Um, and concerning the, the, the topic, at first, when um, the Olena Zelenska Foundation invited me, I was not sure uh, I had something to say about this topic. Uh, but then they give me the, um, the topic of this panel. And um, so I made a movie about uh, war in Chechnya 10 years ago. and. Uh, so I did some research. It was uh, the point of view of a, of a kid. And I did a lot of research uh, on the resilience. And I read the, the books of a French doctor named Boris Cyrulnik. I think he's the first one who bring the word resilience from chemistry to um, the health, the psychiatric uh, department. And, um, and one important thing that he said was that um, Basically, people who had a trauma um, are ashamed of what happened to them and are ashamed of their pain. And they believe that they are not lovable anymore. And one very important step is to be able to tell your own story. And it can be drawing for kids. It can be writing it put it on stage, making a movie, whatever. When you do, let's call it a show of what happened to you, um, you make your own story lovable, and you find again your uh, self-esteem, and you, you come back in the, in the society. Uh, so that works at a personal level. But I believe that works also at a, a country level. But it's not one movie that can change. Uh, there's no one piece of art. Even Guernica didn't change uh, war in Spain. And I mean, there's no, I don't believe one movie can change. But I believe that many, many, many movies, many voices, many people, uh, average people, young directors, old directors, young uh, new faces, they can create a national narrative. So if I can be very pragmatic, we have a wonderful um, syst economic system in France that allows us to make 200 movies a year. We would never do that amount of movies if there was not this political environment created by the politics. And basically, the idea is, any society who make money with movies give money to pre-finance the French cinema. For example, when, when Mr. Penn makes a huge success in France, 
I will use part of that m the money he win he won to make my movie, and we make movies very uh, we call it diversity v from very different spaces, different kind of people in France, thanks to Spider Man or Barbie or whatever. This is a very good uh, way. Just after the war, the World War II. We created the, the National Center of Cinema that collects all that money. And now, this year, uh, the CNC, that National Center, uh, collected 700 million of euros to make movies, plus what the TV channels give, which is 500 million, so it's more than 1 billion just to make movies. And it's not about taxes, it's really a, a virtuous circle um, of the movie industry. So I believe that here in the Ukraine, you have all the democracy behind you, and uh, everybody wants to support Ukraine, and everybody, uh, I mean, we all know how much we owe you, and how much, uh, you fight for our freedom as well. So I believe that you could take advantage to create that kind of, of system here in Ukraine. And that would give you the opportunity to have many, many different movies, not just one story, but like a, a, a panel of different. I met some students last time I came, some um, um, cinema students. And some of them sent me their uh, scripts for short movies. And they were all very good. And it was not about heroic uh, battlefield war movies. It was like little things. But these little things make the history. And I, I'm pretty sure that these little things help average people to understand that, that they are not alone. You have a common destiny. And this is really helpful to feel when you have this trouble to feel that you're not alone and you're part of a, a destin the destiny of a nation. And, uh, and what you're going through now is uh, uh, really historical and, um, and people should be proud of it. Even if they are victims, they really should be proud to be uh, Ukrainian today. And this is what can movie help to uh, make understand. Thanks a lot, and Mr. Boy, I know that we need to let you go, so before you go, uh, probably one brief question to you, and then we'll let you go, and thank you for being with us today. So, uh, to you personally, how do you combine those two notions of the art and the mental health, and which particular art has the closest path towards improving the mental state? Um, I don't know if I do that and if I succeed on that. I think I, I'm, I'm quite careful to to subjects that I think is to me personally important and that might be important and might be in what we say of good information to 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 more people. I, 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 my first feature film I did was about human trafficking and, and very closely built on real true stories in Copenhagen. And uh, I think that that whole idea of getting close to reality in a form that I created was kind of the tool that I wanted to use. The thing I'm doing right now is now is about politics, but also in a fictionalized form. And um, it, it gives me a freedom to interpret the characters in our lives. And I think it might be one of the most important things we can do with film is to let, I mean, film is a way of, I think, letting people practice their own lives. So you, you kind of see and get a new experience, you get a new insight, hopefully, 
and it might give you a chance to, to reflect. I'm not saying it necessarily changes anything. That would be very ambitious to think, but, but I think at least we can help on reflection. And um, if, if I can succeed on that, I think I'm part of the way. Um, and about mental health, I think I didn't do films specially to impact other people's mental health. I'm, 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 I think I'm doing them to, to maybe get a broader view on things. And I think that's one of the things we can do, at least that I can contribute with. Thanks a lot. Uh, and we'll, we're letting you go. Thank you. It's not the end. We are letting go Bo. Everybody else stays. We want to continue. And now Vlada, Kostya, your pictures. This 18 months of war have become a mirror reflecting what's happening and all that will remain in our memory, you know, the eyes of people on your pictures. They said so much more than the background. Now, how the perception of Ukrainians have changed for this time. Sean mentioned just now that Ukrainians did not change much over this time, but I'd say the emotional component has changed. A lot of grief, a lot of joy, you know, that is the problem for mental health right now. There's got to be a balance, right? There are things that we did not see before. So how do you reach out to people? What do you give them so that they could respond? Because, you know, those are the things that we keep thinking, uh, thinking about. And Ukrainians, they get used to war. They get adapted. And you see now that things that were shocking before, just because of the existence, you know, just because this is happening in your country and this is happening to people which live with you, now that becomes a daily routine and people somehow get used to terrorist acts, they get used to deaths of our defenders and somehow that is no longer news. People keep on living their lives and they adapt to two things, things that really are against human nature, talking about ourselves. You know, a year ago, one shell, one more remind, you know, would create almost a shock, you know, we, we panicked when we experienced that, but what's happening now, just two days ago, I was at the front line, you know, I was shelled, they threw bombs at me, I walked through trenches, and that to me already felt like business as usual, you know. I was talking to people, I was helping people, and for me, you know, it's kind of a usual day, you know. Yeah, right. You know, for me, if I were not a Ukrainian, I would probably had a very hard time understanding what you meant. It's scary. It's very hard to comprehend, but that's how things happen. There is no other way. We gotta live on. We gotta move on. And in spite of all these things, so can you? objectively evaluate 
your mental state, our mental state. <laughs> well, everything is okay, you know, globally speaking. Uh, no irreparable damage has been done. But there are some basic things, you know, we uh, respond to loud sounds differently. And this question needs to be addressed not just to us, but I think it needs to be addressed to all Ukrainians. Because when you were born in a peaceful country and lived through the times of peace, for you, war was something very distant, something that you would see in movies, read in the books, something that cannot happen to you, your neighbor, your husband, your family. But now it's happening, and it changes everything. I am convinced that even when we win, when the war is over, there will be some irreversible damage. You will not be feeling safe anymore. Something happened, you know, you survived. And you still will be thinking that things may happen to you again. You know, you will no longer feel safe. So that confidence uh, into the uh, Universal safety has been broken, and I didn't know how much time it's going to take for us to regain this trust, this confidence in the world, and its safe, uh, you know, premises. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with what you've been saying. Right. I will probably ask a benign question for photographers, but for me and for the viewers, it's still interesting. So is there one picture? That one picture that still impacts you mostly in a good or bad way? So you're talking about my our pictures, yeah. So unfortunately, as, as an artist myself, I cannot evaluate our pictures from this angle. You know, when we look at our pictures, we still just look at other things, not just at what this uh, picture projects, but also how much work was invested to get that, to take that picture, what we lived through back then. So when you ask about pictures in this sense, then maybe in 10 years, ask me again. I will look for those pictures again, I will recall things, and I guess then I will be able to respond. Right now, I am not ready to tell you, because you know each and every picture is based on what happened to me. You know, I recall emotions instead of the actual picture, the actual image that people see. Right, I agree, I agree. Generally speaking, we just don't have time to just sit down and analyze. Uh, most of our time is spent around the front lines. Yesterday we arrived to Kyiv just to attend this gathering. Yesterday we were in the Donetsk region and today we're here. So, you know, it's like a marathon. You know, you keep running and running and you don't have time to analyze. You just have to focus on running. And Kostya was right. You know, we cannot speak about a specific work, specific image. It's always a story behind this image, the story of people that you see on the image. You're trying to show the war how it is, you know. You're showing the reality of war, and if you are a journalist, if you are a photographer, you, you see all the atrocities that the military are seeing, and we that's the objective. We want to be with them, we want to go through all those um, bad things that they see, that they live through, so that we could show show all those things to the civilian population. We want everybody else to see what's happening in the war. And our colleagues also document everything that's happening and future generations. Hopefully we'll learn from this. It's very important so they do not make the same exact mistakes that our parents made, grandparents. You know, they have to remember 
who your enemy is not to fall into the same trap. And speaking about our mission, we got to understand that there is a big gap between civilian life in cities like this and frontline life. So we are living through both. We are kind of civilians living lives around front lines, and we want to somehow put that through us, our hearts, our emotions, and show that to the civilians, because people who are fighting the war, they will be back. They will be back into the civilian life, and many of them will not be able to understand what actually happened. So through this art that we do, we want to show things that happened to them, right? Showing things through art. The pictures that you took before February 24, that was art, no doubt. Each and every picture is a piece of art. Now, those pictures that you're making now, is that art or is that something else? Well, Look, I cannot, again, as I said, evaluate my work. It's the viewer that needs to do this. You know, there is a pattern in a picture and a narrative. So when we talk about pattern, we look at some lines, some, you know, compositions. And then when the viewer is looking at the picture, then he or she is saying it's beautiful. Now now, we are not creating, we are observing. So both of those uh, things are pictures, but the processes of taking them are very, very different. But the outcome is kind of similar, because in this or that way, we are still trying to show, to find the angle which produces most of the emotions. And it's talking about a specific moment of time because you sometimes understand that things you've seen, things you live through, even the stress that you feel when you just walk along the uh, destroyed woods, destroyed land, you just look at all this, and static picture won't be able to give you that emotion. Even video won't be able to give you that emotion. So as Kostya mentioned, we want to make sure that this gap between civilian person and military person would be very, very small. And the stress, it's, the, it's always there, every single second when you're there. So that thing needs to somehow translate into, into the information field of regular civilians. At least a little bit, so that these people would understand that it's happening as we speak. Yeah, you asked previously about the fastest avenue to reach the viewer. We believe that pictures, photography is that fastest way to reach out to them. You know, film can kind of draw a better picture, but still pictures, they still, well, I hope Sean doesn't get offended. But I guess that's true. The pictures, they really uh, strike people's hearts more directly and people's emotions. So I'm going to ask you, uh, dear participants about this again. So why this is, and this is a question to you both, so why it's important for you to film the merit of Ukrainian people, the valor of Ukrainian people, why you keep doing this, and you've been doing this for many years, so what makes you help our nation? So who is ready to give me an answer? Well, I, I would say, first, it remains to be seen whether the film I made is helpful. It, of course, is my hope that to one degree or another, it will join hands with all of the other efforts, whether they're creative or, or, or documentary or news, journal, uh, uh, creative photography, photojournalism, 
all of the different elements or ways in which people can reach, because we need a diversity of those, those things to go 360 degrees about, around anyone's imagination. Um, it would never be offensive to me to think that I, I would absolutely agree that that one snapshot it captures something in time uh, in general more potently than, than any other, you know, one thing. But it is time that we're talking about with the creative aspect of things. For example, in, in, in film, and when I say film now, I'm talking not about um, what these cameras do, but what cameras with celluloid running through them do that these cameras are not capable of doing. However, there are special, there are effects that could create a, 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 some kind of a facsimile. But when you're watching film go through a projector, the grain of the film, I would argue, is that which represents time. There's, it sets in, our, uh, in a viewer a passage of time. Which is not to say that with a still photograph, it is to say this, you can't tell someone how long to look at something in a still photograph. And so the difference in, in the forms is so much that where I could stand in front of that painting at, let's say, oh, let's say five feet, and look at it for whatever my imagination wanted to, six seconds. Uh, the filmmaker has a way of le letting the audience know how long to look at something. So in that is another language, a different language, a valuable language that's, that's, that, in, that separates it photographically. And then within the pattern of the grain, there's another aspect of, that, um, what would you say, um, I guess the, the word that becomes cliche, the truth that one is trying to share, to, to tap into, to, to feel, you know, to expose in such a way as to say, because it is a back and forth. Art needs to be shared to exist. I don't believe this idea, I do this for me. Because me represents everybody and everybody represents me. So we're all in this together and anything absent that is um, just denying one's own humanity. Um, and we see what happens when Russians deny humanity. And in it they're denying their own and they evaporate their own. And this is where it ties into the mental health part of it, because unless, even when they're talking, when you are talking about let me bring, letting your audience see the immediacy of this, to having this very thin line between what you do and what the military is doing, that is a loving gesture of saying, we are in this. And it allows those who, for whatever reasons, from good fortune to fear, are not having to be as immediately present in it. They're still part of it, whether they like it or not. And so this is an invitation. So again, you know, with film, be it, uh, you know, what we call a, a documentary, which is a new, for, for me as a director, this will be the first film I did as a director of a documentary. And I can say that the me part of we on this one didn't feel any differently about it than I did. I, I did, don't see it any differently than I do what we'd call a written, a scripted, or, 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 or you know, a fictional film. It was all one experience, only in different forms. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Michel, if you still remember the question, it's the same, actually. But you have to 
uh, repeat the question because he, he bring me somewhere very far and, uh, the essence of the question was why and what uh, makes you to film the heroics of the Ukrainians not to stop and to keep supporting us year in, year out. Okay. <laughs> no, the answer was... Um, no, first, I didn't film about Ukraine. And what I did for Ukraine, I mean, the little thing I did uh, was as a citizen, and uh, as a European citizen maybe, but not as a filmmaker. I used my um, status of filmmaker to bring something, to create some money to send to Ukraine, but not as a filmmaker. I have an, I would love to say that uh, I'm going to do a movie about Ukraine, but I can't make that promise because my relation to my work is, is I don't know, too complex. Uh, or maybe there's a dichotomy between uh, my relation to my, let's say, art or my profession and, and, um, and the rest of my life. I'm now making an animation movie. I'm working on it, on it since five years, and I'm really emerged into it. And I really don't know what I will want to do after that. And I have to be honest with my um, will at, at this time, what I want to do at this time, and, and I have to, to be honest. So in a way, it's a little bit disconnected. In another way, I know that things are interacting and it will have something to do in a way or another and even because things are changing and uh, I mean the way you see things is changing because your um, path of life and um, so that's it. Thanks a lot, and we have just three minutes left. And today, uh, during this mental stage uh, sessions, we are sharing life hacks with our audience. What helps you individually to support your mental health? Because you represent the arts. So as the artists, what would you advise the Ukrainians and people outside of Ukraine? Which form of arts should be used by people to support their mental health uh, in normal state? Let's start with you. Well, you made me think hard because in principle my photo camera is what supports me because any time you can hide yourself behind the small black box and whatever happens on that side of the viewfinder is out there. You're just a viewer and even in the most atrocious moments of life it saves me. But again, uh, it helps me to immerse into my work and uh, I only relate to the stressful situations that happens to me. But speaking about global life hacks, just try to recall what you like to do when you were kids. Um, drawing, singing, uh, trying to recall what sort of an artist you might have evolved into if uh, life would have been different. Just go out, buy some paints and paper, or uh, wait for winter and start making some ice monuments. I don't know, whatever your fantasy will Lada, well, I echo Kostya here because the war is the time where it tells people your life is now. It's not in the future. You live now. So, of course, uh, you need to try and dedicate time to what you like doing in life because when you do what you like doing, it helps Kost and myself uh, with our mental health. For instance, we love watching World War II movies together. Well, it sounds weird because we come back from the front lines and we watch War 
movies still, but for some reason it pacifies us. And I think I understood why, because subconsciously we try to find some new angles to try and see the world anew, and it helps us to re-immerse into our work. And we recognize that our work is uh, stressful, but it's still the most comfortable environment for us. It's uncomfortable for us to be uh, just an ordinary civilians. Subconsciously, we still try to get back where we feel uh, a comfort zone. But again, I'm not probably talking about the mental health. It's vice versa. It's how uh, to stay sane. Yeah, but uh, at the end of all the movies, it's all about the victory. You know that the world were to end it with the victory. And that's what supports us. Thank you. Michel? Um, personally, I draw. And when I draw, um, I take time for myself without knowing it. And it's almost like I, I do not, uh, I don't do meditation, but I guess it's kind of the same thing. And um, I think it's very important to make a pause. Uh, as Costa said, if you remember what you love to do when you were kids, it's really connect you with a very pure or simple things of your uh, simple place uh, of your part of yourself and uh, and just to spend time with yourself and um, I'm pretty sure it helps whatever I mean I wish I could play music I, I don't unfortunately but um, it's very important for me to draw every day and a day without drawing is um, more difficult, I, I would say. So, yeah, practice, whatever, pottery, even sport. I mean, the notion of art is, is can be, I mean, on that topic, uh, cooking can do the, the same <coughs> effect. And just doing something you involve too and you forget yourself. Thank you so much, Diaco. Shone. Sean, and back to you. We would like to hear your life hacks. My look, whether someone is a, a photographer, um, a director, an actor, not every, a musician, not everybody is in the sense that they know how or are moved to practice it literally. But I have this sort of doubtless belief then in, in every human being, there are extraordinary images. It, there is extraordinary music. And so I think that a way, a, a way to practice health through creativity is to take a moment to hear one's own music, to find it, to let oneself be open enough to find that great symphony that's manifesting itself in whatever way it comes, to see those images, the hard ones and the wonderful ones, and to share them with someone who loves them, and to then be open to that person sharing it with them. Because when we, when we put those things creative as separate from us, we separate ourselves from the human imagination that connect, connects us. <clears throat> and it really is not the exclusive domain of the artist. Art does not belong to the artist alone. It belongs to everybody, and not only as an appreciator, but as a creator of it. And I think that's one of the gifts we got, and being able to intermittently focus on that gift with all of the other things pulling at one. Or and I would argue that for me, you know, today, and it's really what I meant about not changing, not, I wouldn't be ever to assume that I know who's changed or not. But what has not changed since February 2022 or November, when I, November 2021, when I first came here, is I feel like I hear the greatest, most tuned together s symphony, 
harmony of any music that a people has represented in my lifetime. Thanks a lot, and I hope that everyone uh, found it uh, extremely exciting, and I'm grateful to our unbelievable uh, guests. Uh, here we put the full stop, but we still have the third block of our summit, which is dedicated to adolescents. So stay with us, and this third block will start with the movie premiere.